I will start today's lecture with uh, repeating what has been said here a little bit in a rush at the end of the last week's lecture. And that was the overview of different physical properties and physical uh, states that can be described by tensors. Plenty of state variables such as heat capacity, uh, sorry, such, such as uh, entropy, temperature, or pressure are scalar quantities. Many other quantities that describe the state of the material are described by vectors, such as polarization vector, uh, electric intensity vector, that is, I think, all what we have actually here. Uh, or, right, or we, here we have a different fluxes, be it thermal flux or electrical flux. Other properties, sorry, other states of the material can be described by second rank tensors. We haven't spoken about them yet, but we know them from our general background. We know about strain and stress. Both of these are second rank quantities that describe a state of the material. The fact that they are second rank tensors is uh, shown here by the fact that the objects are described by two different indices. We know that when we represent them in, uh, in coordinate state, then they would be uh, in, a, in a coordinate frame, they would be represented by a three by three matrix in the case of three dimensional space. Between the state variables hold various physical laws that connect them. So we have, for example, a connection between the temperature and the entropy again. We have a certain relationship between the electric flux and the intensity of electric field. We have a certain relationship between the strain and the change of the temperature. And all of these physical laws in their simplest way can be expressed using linear relationships as it's written here, uh, where the constants of linear dependence are physical properties of materials. In the case of the relationship between heat capacity and the change of the temperature, we have their heat capacity. In the case when we try to relate uh, the electric flux and intensity of electric field, we have their electric conductivity for the strain and change of the temperature, we get tensor of thermal expansion. For the relationship between the stress and strain, we get a tensor of elastic constants. Uh, these properties are also tensors of different ranks from scalars, so zeroth rank to uh, first rank tensors, where we have the uh, pyroelectricity, that means uh, based on the change of the temperature, we generate a certain polarization in the material up to the uh, second order or second rank tensors, such as the uh, electric conductivity, third rank tensors, such as here or here, which correspond to the piezoelectric effect up to the fourth rank tensors where we uh, link to second rank tensors. The rank of the tensor that describes a physical property and therefore the relationship between the state variables um, is given by the ranks of the tensors describing the state variables. So if I have a state variable, of the zeroth rank, uh, which links, or which is somehow linked to the state variable of the second rank, the relationship is given by a physical property that can be described by a tensor 
of the rank that is sum of these two ranks. So in this case, it would be two plus zero is the rank number two. For the elasticity, we have two tensors of the second rank, and therefore the elastic constants relating them are the uh, fourth rank tensor. If nothing else is taken home from this lecture, then I would like you to remember the triangle we have here that links various uh, state properties with various effects. So we have again here strain and stress, for example, noted with the rank of their tensors that they are uh, described with, and the relationship between them is uh, the elasticity. We link stress and, uh, for example, entropy, we would talk about piezo-caloric effect. What we will be talking about today is the a relationship between temperature and strain. And this relationship is called thermal expansion and so on and so forth. So in this triangle that we have here, we have actually plenty of different relationships, plenty of different physical laws put together put in one concept of this tensorial uh, expression, how different state variables and state of the material are linked together via state proper, uh, via material properties. I would like to state here or repeat here one thing from the last week, and that is that uh, the state of a quantity or state of the material can be almost, uh, almost arbitrary. So you can apply any strain to your material that you can think about um, as long as you apply the mechanical load to your material. Um, you can deform a cubic material in the shape of a hexagon. You can do that, of course. On the other hand, the material properties, they reflect the crystal symmetry. So based on the, ten, uh, based on the crystal symmetry of your material, you will have a certain shape of the tensor uh, that expresses the corresponding physical property. So this is the basic difference between the matrices representing state variables and matrices or higher order matrices representing physical properties. With that, let me now come to the topic of today's lecture, which is the strain and the thermal expansion. And uh, let's go through this quickly. So here we have an example of a one-dimensional spring, uh, which is denoted by two endpoints, P and Q and they are in a distance of delta x. And now you deform this spring. It's a 1D body, it's a 1D material. So all what we can do is just to move it horizontally. That means that our point P moves from the position that we have here, the initial one, it moves by a distance uh, up, so it moves to a new position P prime. At the same time, the point Q moves from its original position by the distance UQ to a new position Q prime. By doing this, the whole spring length changes by delta X plus delta U. Delta U is the difference between the displacement of the endpoint Q and the endpoint P. Eventually, what we want to describe with the strain is not how we are moving our spring, but how we are changing its shape. So we want to say that certain strain is applied, certain deformation happens when the delta U 
is non-zero. If the point P and Q move by the same amount, we do not expect, we do not want to describe this situation by any strain, by any deformation. You still can have deformation locally, despite the fact that the endpoints do not change. And that would be if the strain, if the deformation is not homogeneous. And for that reason, we actually define the derivative of the change of the displacement delta u with the change of delta x. So in other words, if I have, for example, a point P, which moves from here to, uh, which moves from here to here, then I have the neighboring point, which moves from here to here, whereas the next point here moves just a little bit backwards. And then I have the end point, which moves again by the same amount as was the amount of uh, the displacement of point P. Then in my total change of the distance, I would have delta u equals zero. But obviously you see that what would happen with my spring was originally everywhere the same. I would get it that it gets stretched and then very much condensed. And at the end of the day, uh, again, maybe with the same uh, spacing of the individual uh, windings as at the beginning. So my length of the spring does not change. But locally, we see that it changes. And that's the motivation for actually uh, defining the strain using the derivative. So then I have the strain as a function of position. In the case that the strain is homogeneous everywhere, all about homogeneous stretching, and then the displacement u, delta u, is simply a linear function of the position, right? So homogeneous stretching, the strain becomes constant, and the displacement is a linear function of the position. We try now to generalize this concept to a two dimensions. So let us now consider a point P, which is at a certain position X. Now U and X are both vectors, two dimensional vectors. Right? So by applying a certain deformation, by uh, undergoing uh, the deformation of my material, the point P moves from this position P to position P prime. That means the vector, uh, the point P is moved by the vector U P. Now I consider a different point. I consider a point Q. And by applying the same deformation, which caused the displacement of point P to P prime, the point Q changes to the position Q prime. Now again, if the P and Q relative relationship is unchanged, I do not want to talk about any strain, about any deformation. So what I am interested in is how does the displacement of the point Q change from the displacement of the point P? How is it different? And I will again define this using derivatives. So um, I will then say that the uh, whole deformation of the material would be deformed, would, would be defined using four derivatives. That is, we have two components of the vector u. How does this displacement vector u in two dimensions with two components change? As we are moving along the two principal axes of our uh, coordinate frame, x1 and x2, that allows me to define four different partial derivatives and arrange these four variables as an element of two by two matrix. What is the meaning of these individual 
components of this matrix, four by four matrix? Well, if you think about, for example, the uh, epsilon or E11, which was the U1 over the X1, that tells you how does the component U1, so in the direction of the axis X1, how does it change when we are moving from the point P along this axis, right? So it says essentially from point P, if I go towards right, how does the stretching in this direction change with position? If it's constant, then I have homogeneous stretching and I'm again in the 1D uh, case as I had before. However, this stretching might be different if I go along different axis, right? So I, well, I go along the same axis, but at different points. So then I might have actually a dependence of this whole strain also on the position where I am. Is it at point P or is it somewhere else? For example, E11 at point Q2. That in the case that the, these two are the same, so E11 is constant, I obtain again the homogeneous stretching. If they are different, I will obtain um, general strain, general deformation of my material. Similarly, the E21 component tells you how does the component in the perpendicular direction uh, builds as you are moving along the X1 axis. So you go in this direction away from the point P and you are measuring how far are the individual points displaced in perpendicular direction. And so eventually the uh, relationship, again, if it's a constant, will lead to the fact that delta U2 is a linear function of the position, so how far you are from the point P, the original coordinate frame. And that means that all the points would be shifted on a line, which is tilted from my original position of the point, right? So this would be my original point. And after applying this homogeneous strain E to one, points would be shifted onto this line. If the E to one is small enough, then actually this relationship, so delta U two, over delta x1, so how far did I move along the x1, will be equal to the, uh, well, this is not for small, but in general, this will be equal to the tang tangents of the angle theta, where if theta is small, this is the same as sine theta, which is the same as theta expressed in radians. It means for small strains, these strain components with mixed indices essentially tell you how are the axes tilted by application of this strain. So in this particular case, this component E21 tells you how far or by which angle is the axis X1 tilted by this application of this strain. <clears throat> the strain is a tensor. I've mentioned this already several times, but uh, in fact, up to now, we have defined the strain uh, as just a certain relationship between two displacement fields. So it would be now up to you to derive or to prove that it is indeed a strain. And to do so, you would now express both vectors in two different coordinate frames, since both the displacement field as well as the position are vectors, positional vectors. We know how they change when we go from one coordinate frame into another coordinate frame. 
that allows us to express the strain in one and in another coordinate frame, use the transformation relationships both on the displacement field as well as on the positional um, vectors and eventually end up with a formula we have seen already last week that links the value of the strain object, we say, but uh, let's say now, now already the tensor in one coordinate frame and, well, this is not the first one here, in one coordinate frame and here in another coordinate frame. And we again see that in order to transform the strain from one coordinate frame into the another coordinate frame, so in this particular case from the primed coordinate frame here into the unprimed, into the original, we need to apply two transformation matrices, which can be then rewritten in the form that we have here. We remember that this was exactly the definition or the way that we uh, we sort of recognized that a certain object transforms as a vector. I would remind you here of the Einstein summation rule, which means that we sum over repeating indices, in this case, K and L, right? So again, with the vector L, we actually recognize here a matrix multiplication because this can be rewritten in A, K, I, E prime, K, L, A, L, J without any loss of generality. We see that here the index L is next to each other. So this indeed represents a matrix multiplication, whereas the first one does not. We have the index K as the first one here, as well as the first one here. So we can, uh, we can change this. We can change the matrix AKI into A transposed IK. And then again, we would see that the index K now becomes as a second position. Here it's the first position. So these two matrices would, again, all these two objects would represent matrix multiplication. So I eventually end up with the relationship that E in the unprimed coordinates as a tensor equals to the matrix A, the transformation uh, matrix times E times A. So what we have uh, shown here last week. Excuse me, professor. Yes. What mean that uh, thing above the E and the A, what's the meaning of that symbol? That just represents that it's a matrix. So I do not have ah, okay. both letters here. So that is just the way how you can represent matrix. Um, I think in continuum mechanics, people would, for example, put here uh, for matrix two underlined curves. If you are working yes. just with matrices, right, you would just write A. So. It's only a representation. At this point, it has nothing to do, for example, with any um, with any functionals or operators or nothing like that. It's just a symbol for matrix that I'm sometimes using. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. You're welcome. All right. So let us have a look at some simple examples of the formations of strains. What if you look at pure rotation, right? Certainly such a, well, it's not deformation, but certain transformation can be expressed using the strain that we have defined up to now. And if you do so, we then say that uh, by pure rotation, both of the axes, both x1 as well as x2, would be rotated by the same angle. And assume that this angle is small, means uh, that uh, we know directly what are the uh, what are the strains of diagonal strains uh, as a function of this angle. So 
if I want to rotate the whole coordinate system by angle theta, then directly E21 is uh, theta and E12 would be minus theta, right? Uh, at the same time, if these rotations are small, I will not get any change of the distances. So that means that there is the E11 is equal to zero. So essentially, I do not have any change of uh, or any generation of the displacement in the U1 direction as I go along this axis. And that means that such a small Q rotation would be expressed by tensor, strain tensor, which has on the diagonal zeros and the off diagonals are uh, anti-symmetric. We see the angles theta and minus theta there. Well, now you take into consideration your physical engineering intuition. What do you want to describe by strain? Do you want to describe really where does your object move? how does it move or do you want to describe the deformation in this case obviously no deformation appears so probably this is a situation in which we would expect in general zero strain if you just think about for example a piezoelectric effect which links the generated polarization, generated electric field and the material of the applied deformation. You do not expect that any polarization happens by rotating your object. Maybe it would if there is some external electric field, but this is another, uh, another phenomenon which we do not want to describe. We do, do want to describe directly the generation of the uh, electric field polarization by applying mechanical load. You probably know these uh, German blinking shoe, the uh, blinking shoes where the kids, when they are running, the shoes are uh, emitting light. Or I have also recently seen something like that being implemented in the scooters that kids use. Right? Or sometimes you have it in the wheels of uh, skateboards. Uh, all of this is based on piezoelectric effect. As soon as you apply certain load of it, there is a small electric field generated, which uh, loads the condensator, which uh, eventually then is able to supply the power to emit the light. Right? But you do not expect that if you take this shoe and you just rotate it in your table without applying any deformation to it, that it would start emitting light. It would start emitting light if you deform it, if you change its shape, if you applied a force on it. And from this intuitive understanding of what we want to describe with strain, we want actually to get rid of these situations. We want that strains that correspond to rotations are not resulting in the strain as describing the deformation. So what are we going to do is not complete the course, sorry, moved somewhere, won't now. Oh, there we are. Right. <laughs> right, so what we want to do is that we split now our strain tensor as we have used it up to now into the symmetrical and anti-symmetrical parts. That means we symmetrize the strain tensor into this form and we anti-symmetrize it. Obviously, the sum of these two objects will yield epsilon ij plus omega ij will yield a tensor, which is the one that we used before, this eij. Okay. What does it mean that we have a symmetric and anti-symmetric part? 
The symmetric part means that the strain tensor takes such a form that the off-diagonal terms above and below the main diagonal are identical and are reflected by the uh, diagonal of this matrix. For the anti-symmetrical, it's the, almost the same with the fact that the components uh, change their sign. So I can schematically draw it this way. They change their sign as soon as I would reflect them with respect to the main axis of this uh, of this matrix. And from now on, we will understand or we will call this object epsilon ij the symmetric part of the previously called strain, this is what we will now call the strain tensor. Whereas the resulting antisymmetric part, omega, represents the rotation of the whole system. And therefore, it does not result into any macroscopic uh, shape change. Therefore, we want to uh, isolate this out of our strain tensor. Right. So from now on, whenever I say strain tensor, I understand this definition here, which means that our strain tensor is symmetrical. This is the important thing. It's symmetrical. There is no other reason than our definition for this. This is not given by the request from the crystal symmetry. This is simply that we want to split now the uh, description of the change of displacement field with the position into the formation of the shape and rotation. So here we have it schematically. A general strain is now the physical strain expressed by the symmetrical uh, tensor plus a rotation. And this is what we will not be discussing because this is not of interest with respect to the elasticity. All right, this is again a playing which I will probably leave for you if you are interested so you can express how does this uh, strain tensor change when we rotate the coordinate frame. It's just uh, an exercise on matrix multiplication. So I'm not going to go into detail here. Up to now, we've been discussing two dimensional cases, but actually the matrices, when I explained the symmetry and anti-symmetry, those matrices that I draw there, they were already representing three dimensional case. So three dimensional case is a straightforward generalization of the 2D with again, uh, the same definition for the strain tensor being a symmetrical tensor where we see that this would correspond to epsilon uh, sorry eij and this would correspond to eji so that's exactly our definition we had before um, on the diagonal body diagonal we get the components eii and obviously the definition leads to a symmetrical matrix symmetrical tensor uh, please note this writing here, no summation. Without this note here, we would automatically understand that we have here some over i because we have two repeating indices, right? Or here we would also understand summation over i. So in fact, if I want to have a diagonal component of our matrix, I have to write it with the summation no summation. Otherwise, this represents essentially a trace of the matrix epsilon, which means epsilon 1, 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 plus epsilon 3, 3 plus more if we have more dimensional matrix. That's the price we have to pay for the Einstein summation. And also, 
you have to bear with me that I'm a little bit chaotic sometimes or inconsistent in terms of how we label it. And it's not just me, it's a general usage. So we'll be freely switching between labeling the axis X, Y, Z, labeling them X1, X2, and X3, and using instead of X1, X2, and X3, just the indices of the, of the axis, right? So essentially, epsilon x, y is the same thing as epsilon x1, x2 is the same thing as epsilon x1, 2. Probably this would be absolutely intuitive even without noting this here, but for the completeness, I need to note it. I need to say it here. I will never use a notation saying du2 over a partial derivative 3. Okay, this is not what I will be using. Whenever we have here really not just the component or the axis, but when we need to have the whole variable, then of course I always write it. But x3 is the same thing as z in the following discussions. We have already said that the off diagonal terms represent the change or the tilting of the axis, right? Now, uh, we also know that our strain tensor needs to be symmetrical. That means uh, eventually that if my x1 axis or x axis rotates by a certain angle or tilts by a certain angle, I expect that the other axis rotates by the same angle towards the first axis. And that means that instead of describing this angle, which is directly the component of the strain tensor, would be for me more convenient to describe the overall change of the angles between these two axes. Right? So uh, if I say that originally the axis x1 and x2 at 90 degrees here, I now would like to say that after applying the deformation, this angle changes maybe to 70 degrees. And therefore, these two angle, these two axes were tilted by 20 degrees towards each other. This yields the definition of so-called engineering shear strain. Right? This is a sum of the two strain components, epsilon 2, 1 and epsilon 1, 2, which once again makes a very good sense. The problem with this is that very often this engineering shear strain is written together with the other components, with the diagonal components of the shear tensor, uh, of, the, of the strain tensor. They are written together in one matrix. So they would be then written in this form. Now this is two times epsilon xy, this is also 2 times epsilon xy, which is the same thing as 2 times epsilon yx. When we know that epsilon xx, epsilon xy, epsilon xz, epsilon yz, yx, and so on, when this object transforms as a tensor, is a tensor, then when I change arbitrarily the factors here to two, such object, which is this matrix, including the engineering strains, does not transform like a tensor. Now, what does it mean? The transformation, <coughs> excuse me, transformation of a tensor or does not transform as a tensor. This simply means that by changing the coordinates, I do not have an absolutely straightforward way how to obtain the new uh, engineering shear components in the new coordinate frame, right? I know how to transform the physical shear, a uh, physical strain. So the total strain tensor from one coordinate frame into another coordinate frame. I do not know right away, I cannot write it in this form, that this is now the, en the engineering shear strain in the primed coordinate frame. I cannot write this. 
Okay. So what I need to do is that first from here, I come to the physical uh, strain that I can transform into the epsilon prime. And this I can again rewrite into the engineering by multiplying the uh, corresponding of diagonal components. Right. So please be careful about it. When someone gives you a shear, and it's particularly for the shear components, be always careful whether we talk about the tensorial shear components or whether we talk about the engineering shear components or engineering shear strains. The shear, sorry, the shear, the strain is a symmetrical matrix and oh, is expressed by a symmetrical matrix. It is a symmetrical tensor. And as such, it can be always converted into a coordinate frame in which it takes a diagonal form, right? So I can find a certain coordinate frame in which the same deformation is described simply by a, a diagonal tensor it means all the off diagonal terms are zero. And in such coordinate frame, I call, or such coordinate frame, I call the principal axis coordinate frame. The fact that something like that can be done uh, goes into mathematics, into uh, the so called quadratic form algebra, where you can uh, prove that this is always possible. By plane strain, we understand a deformation only in one plane. That means that now we will have in coordinate, uh, sorry, in the principal axis, we will have uh, non-zero, only two diagonal components. The third one in the axis perpendicular to this plane, or not necessarily perpendicular to this plane, but in a direction which is not in this plane, third direction, the third principal axis, the deformation along this axis is equal to zero. For pure shear, we then talk about uh, two off-diagonal terms being non-zero and being equal. So this is exactly that the two axes tilt towards each other, which we have spoken about before. And it can be shown. that the pure shear is actually just plane strain in a coordinate frame, which is rotated by 45 degrees. So in the first place, what I said before is that for each coordinate frame, we can find another coordinate frame in which the tensor takes a diagonal form. This would be the principal axis coordinate frame. So that means there must be coordinate frame which would transform this into epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, and zero everywhere else. Right? And on top of that, it turns out that for pure shear, so I have just splitting of two axes, this principal axis coordinate frame would actually lead to a only plane strain. So there is no deformation along the third axis. So what happens is uh, shown in the picture that we have down here, where in the original coordinate frame, which is the, uh, so now I have to think about it a little bit. Uh, the original coordinate frame would be the one connected with the a red object here. In the red object, uh, we would be talking about applying shear that is applied along, for example, this axis, right? So something like that, plus something like this, shear components would lead to the change, uh, sorry, these guys. So these shear components 
would lead uh, in the coordinate frame, which is linked with the dashed lines, uh, would lead to the shear strain that we have here. So the uh, transform our red square into the uh, green object that we have here. However, we can also transform the coordinate frames into the axes, which are horizontal and vertical. And in that case, we obtain the same deformation by simply applying a tension in the x-axis and compression along the y-axis, which is indeed what is shown here. Okay, so that would be then probably uh, y, uh, epsilon and minus epsilon. I've just uh, changed here the, the axis, right? So in other words, we have here an particular example in which we see that when I look at my problem with 45 degrees rotated perspective, so then I say, I take my object like this and I change its shape into this shape. I'm obviously thinking about the applying of the shear. I shear everything in these directions. But I can also look at it that I rotate the whole object by 45 degrees, which is done here. And then I see that in this principal axis, in this different coordinate frame, the whole deformation is corresponding to pure, strain, uh, pure tension and compression along these two axes. So once again, I transform the pure shear into the plane strain. Sorry, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, all these considerations are ho or hold only valid if the angles are small, right? Because only if I can do the approximation that sine of theta is theta, then this um, holds true. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. That's absolutely true. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So we talk here, everything of this, we talk actually in the... Um, limit of small strains. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Which is eventually what um, we, in principle, can apply when we want to talk about the linear elasticity, which is what we will do later on, right? So for any larger strains, uh, most likely we will anyway leave the linear elasticity regime and we need to have uh, more complicated descriptions than the simple Hooke's law. <coughs> I showed here at the beginning with the relationship between the stress and strain. Hmm. But you're right, you're right, yeah. And we actually hit this topic, exactly this topic right now. That's what I want to say here, that uh, the simple shear, which is what typically you would uh, understand on the application of shear, that you apply two forces in plane and they lead to the change of the square shape into this uh, tilted square, right? So when you get an, a package from Amazon and you need to get rid of the cardboard, uh, you simply step on it and you make it flat. So that's this deformation that we are making here. Um, we want to describe it in the concept of our strain definitions as a change of the shape plus a certain rotation. And here exactly we are hitting what you just said, that strictly speaking, this is true only in the limit of small strains. When the uh, strain, the off-diagonal strain, the shear strain is actually corresponding to the rotational angles. So hopefully this then uh, even more uh, supports the answer and your your statement from from previous slide. Sorry, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, could there also be a minus in the pure shear uh, matrix? Is it done in the other direction or perpendicular a deformation? Minus here. Uh, if there was a minus in the in the pure shear matrix, like there. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So with this shear that when we have the positive ones, I think the easiest one is to say, then what we do with the axis is that we do such deformation, right? If I have negative now with the minus sign, so put it here in green, then what I would be doing with the axis is doing this thing. So I go exactly as you said in the negative uh, directions because uh, then the minus sign here corresponds eventually to the angle how I'm rotating, right? So plus angle is in one direction and minus angle is in the other direction. Okay, thanks. But then again, if I would look at the shape, whether it takes such shape or eventually it would be to such shape, uh, I will have either tension in this direction or in this direction. So the principal axis that I would uh, obtain are the same ones just rotated by 45 degrees. So in here, I would then end up with epsilon and minus epsilon. Okay. Mm -hmm. But a very good question here. Yeah. All right, again, running behind the schedule. So very quickly, thermal expansion. And maybe we'll then have a look at some of these bits uh, again as a starter next week. Thermal expansion uh, is uh, describing the change of the shape of material of our object with the change of temperature. When I have a change of the shape, that means I have strain on one axis. So this is what I want to uh, know. And I want to know the strain applied deformation as a function of temperature. The relationship here, this is called the thermal expansion or coefficient of thermal expansion. And from the intuitive arguments we had here at the beginning, when we have a tensor of the zeroth rank and tensor of the second rank, then the thermal expansion should be second rank tensor. Right? Good. The second rank tensor is then described by a matrix. So if you now think about uh, simply the mathematical objects, I have a three by three matrix here. I have a three by three matrix here, and I have a number, which is the change of the temperature. So this is the second rank tensor, second rank tensor of thermal expansion and I multiply it by temperature. Again, everything in the uh, approximation of small strains and uh, linear thermal expansion and so on. Good. Now, uh, this has a certain implications both on the strain as well as on the thermal expansion tensors. If we go from the strain towards thermal expansion. The definition of the strain yields a symmetrical matrix. That means that the matrix that describes a thermal expansion must be symmetrical as well. Right? This is not a general case for the second rank tensors describing material properties. They, can, they do not have to be symmetrical. Because this is a property related the strain on one side and the temperature on the other side, it must have the same shape, same properties as the strain, and therefore it must be a symmetrical matrix. We can go also the other direction. All right. That's in indeed here. In the other direction, we say that the strain, the thermal strain, the deformation generated by simply changing temperature uh, is given by multiplying the thermal expansion by temperature. Thermal expansion is a material property and as such will reflect the crystal symmetry. It will have a certain symmetry dictated shape for cubic crystals, for hexagonal crystals, for um, tetragonal crystals, and so on. That means that if I have a certain shape given by the crystal symmetry for the thermal expansion, 
I will have the same shape also of the thermal strain. Means if the thermal strain, in general, strain can have any shape, right? Can be any uh, sort of, I, I can apply any strain. But as soon as I generate the strain, generate the deformation by changing the temperature, the strain will reflect, the change of the shape will reflect the crystal symmetry. This has a lot of implications. If you just think about, for example, hexagonal material. A hexagonal material has thermal expansion different, intuitively, and we'll talk about it a little bit more next week, has a different thermal expansion along one axis, along the hexagonal axis, and has the same thermal expansion everywhere in the plane. So if I now thermally expand a hexagonal material, means that along the hexagonal axis, the change of the dimension will be different than in the perpendicular directions. That means that if, for example, I would take a spherical object and I heat it up, and the sphere is carved out of a hexagonal material, say titanium ball, it should expand in such a way that it will get elongated along one direction. And I can immediately identify the crystallographic hexagonal axis. The fact that uh, the alpha, the thermal expansion coefficient, is related to the strain and is symmetrical also leads to the fact that if I work in the principal axis, I can also transform the uh, thermal expansion always into just a diagonal matrix, leading to the fact that in principal axis coordinate frame, which is not necessarily your conventional crystallographic coordinate frame, right? But there always exists such a coordinate frame in which I will have only three thermal expansion coefficients. Maybe not the most convenient ones because I will have a material which looks, I don't know what, uh, monoclinic, but as a consequence of the change of my coordinate frame, I will have to express it in some crazy uh, coordinates. But the thing that I gain is that in such a crazy coordinate frame, the thermal expansion would take diagonal form and would be expressed only with three numbers, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three along the principal axis. <clears throat> 